My story begins in 1997. I was a freshman, first year uh, in college in a very secular uh, university, uh, Polytechnic University of Timisoara. Uh, knowing nobody there, I went to find an accommodation in a student campus. I was placed in a room with other three boys. Um, and very soon, you know, as you get to know the boys, everyone tries to set the rules. And one of the first rules that they tried to set was uh, the hours we can use the room by ourselves. And you might understand what means that. Privacy, because they are coming with girls. And um, I was shocked to see the moral decay of my generation. I was born in, in a Christian family, raised in the church, grew up in a Christian school. So for me it was really a shock to see where my generation arrived and how life, student life in a campus where there are no moral rules. No time to be quiet, no time to you know, sleep or to uh, even cook in the room uh, and come with anybody and you know, look to dirty movies over the night. And in that moment, I felt that if I don't do something, I'll die. I'll die spiritually. And I really, I mean, I was new in my faith and I didn't want to to, to get in this dirt. And I prayed to God for help. And very soon, just the next day, I found out two other men, same age, same school, same year actually, same specialization, uh, who were in different rooms, but in the same building. They had the same feelings. So we came together and said, well, let's raise hands and let's watch one, on one over another, otherwise we will die. But what we can do? None of us had any experience in discipleship, in group leading. In, and the other two looked at me and said, well, you are a son of a pastor, you lead us. Uh, we are just sons of deacons, so there's no... Uh, and uh, one of them offered to, to play, he played the guitar, and he said, well, I can help with, with songs. And the other one said, I can take the offering, but that's, that's most of the help. And I was, I think you can still tell very much, I was very shy. Even if I was raised in church, where well, my father was a public speaker, I never had the courage to speak in public. So even, even just with these two guys, I was afraid. But the Lord used them to encourage me to start, just to open the Bible. They knew much less than me, let's say. And so they were excited of any verse I opened and I say with other words what the, what the verse says. So this was the, the beginning. And the Lord blessed it very much. Very soon, in the next weeks, we heard about other uh, young men in the campus. And by the end of the year, we were 16 uh, in our group. And uh, beginning of next year, one from the group said, it's not fun without girls, so just men. Let's invite some ladies, because we know some ladies from our churches. So this is how the group grew, but still we had our meetings, men, the, the, what we called at that time discipleship groups, but it was just the beginning of, let's say, a group that searched for growth and for protection in, in, uh, in that area. Um, I'm pretty sure most of you are much more experienced than myself. So I hope this time together will be a time of sharing one another as much as possible. I will go very as fast as I can on, on the slides. Um, so yesterday we looked at the what of the discipleship. Today 
we are going into a much more practical uh, uh, presentation, but let me just state for, from the beginning um, the vision. And this Bible verse is really, I think, excites our hearts. Him, Jesus Christ, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. I must tell you that there is nothing more significant that happened in my life, a part of my marriage, uh, that we experienced with our discipleship group that I, t I told you I started. We started together back in the 97. Um, all of my colleagues that were in the group at that time, all are in the church today, 20 years later, but not just that they are attached to a local church. All of them are active. Uh, none of them pastors, but all of them are elders, leaders, and I really believe that if we follow the model of Christ and invest into small numbers in discipleship, this really uh, brings fruit and fruit that lasts, uh, maturity in Christ. And um, let me give you two quick uh, uh, quotes, and then I will let you uh, discuss or think about this. John Stott says, you can become a Christian in a moment, but not a mature Christian. Christ can enter, cleanse, and forgive you in a matter of seconds, but it will take much longer for your character to be transformed and molded into his will. It takes only a few minutes for a bride and bridegroom to be married, but in the rough and tumble of their home, it may take many years for two strong wills to, de to be dovetailed into one. So when we receive Christ, a moment of commitment will lead to a lifetime of adjustment. Do you agree? Is this your experience? Okay, one more quote and then we go. Perhaps pastors, or I would say, disciples, disciple-making leaders, should imagine that they are going to have three more years in their parish as pastor, and that there will be no replacement for them when they leave. If they acted as if this were going to happen, they put, would put the highest priority on selecting, motivating, and training lay leaders that could carry on as much as possible of the mission of the parish after they left. The results of three sustained years of such an approach would be quite significant, even revolutionary. I don't know about you, but uh, when I read this, I was pastoring a church and I had board meetings every week, choir, you know, importance to encourage the choir rehearsal, uh, running all around with all sorts of building uh, projects at the church, renovation and uh, uh, camps, uh, you know, and I realize I'm just encouraging activism. You may know this term, encouraging uh, a church structure, but not really helping my people be more mature. And I had a new, you know, in, in our churches every year we have an annual meeting of evaluation. I had no, no, no reports other than activities and projects that I had. But no reports on, you know, how many people in my church read the Bible more consistently this year. How many people in my church, you know, are more courageous in sharing their faith. And what are some of their struggles, you know, in sharing their faith in a secular context? How many uh, of my church members are serious in their spiritual disciplines? Well, all of this, 
are not things that, you know, your board, you know, are very interested in, in hearing because they are looking to numbers and to things to report. But I realized that Christ had this vision when he came for a, a, a limited amount of time, having to, to, to start the church and, you know, fulfill all the plan that God had. So very quick, how to start? I'm sure you all know this basic truth. Prayer, I think it's crucial. So many times we, and at least myself, I take a piece of paper and I start writing, you know, brainstorming, writing a list of names, possible people, try, starting to, to do phone calls. I think it's utterly wrong. I think most important is to start by praying and as Andres said yesterday, this is how Christ started. Uh, then screening, of course, is important. And, you know, these two important things, availability and teachability. There are people who may want to be part of a discipleship group. They feel the need to grow, but they are not available. You know, they cannot in the moment of life they are. Um, maybe they just have a a baby maybe you know they uh, in the next month they will leave for six months you know for a student exchange in another university or uh, others uh, are not teachable uh, they uh, they will miss a lot of meetings so you want to see that the holy spirit prepares that that heart then i think are very important uh, personal invitations um, just meeting someone in the lobby of a church and trying to cast this vision and invite him to, to your uh, discipleship group, I think it's not enough. I think it's important uh, to sit down with that man or woman to have enough time to, to present the vision, uh, let him or her time to process, to uh, understand, to write back, meet once again, maybe have a pizza, have a juice, and uh, this personal invitation really helps them grasp the vision and then realize the commitment that, that they have. Define expectations. Uh, at this point, I think when you are really at the beginning of the group, it's dangerous to present all the expectations because at least in my country, most probably, probably they will say no. If you tell them you will have this amount of reading, we will follow up you on your Bible reading, on your prayer life, on your marriage, on your kids, on your... Uh, um, uh, it, it's too much. I think the best approach is to lower the expectations at the beginning, let them come to the group, even come more people uh, for... And then you define, you see the, the, the group dynamics. After a semester, you know, 10, 12 weeks, I think it's, it's enough time for those people to commit. And then usually we ask for a year commitment. Uh, uh, and uh, at that moment, when they, are, when they already fall in love with you, with the group, with the vision, they, they already see in their spiritual life uh, fruits from their prayer life or, you know, Bible studying and then, you know, outreaching and all the disciplines that you will put in place, um, they will want to be in the group. And in that moment, you can, you know, raise the expectations. Um, but it's important to, to clarify uh, because otherwise, to busy people, many requests will come and uh, they will fill in their program very, very soon and very quick and uh, stick to a small number. I know it's all this pressure of numbers, but I learned the hard way that Christ decided to take only 12. Who am I to think that I can do more uh, people in less time? And, you know, fast food maybe works, but not fast discipleship. Um, I just want to give you a quick car illustration to have a successful journey. I think you need three things. A good driver, 
a vehicle, good vehicle, and of course uh, a map. If we uh, translate this into discipleship, I would say the driver is the intentional leader, is you, who intentionally build relationships in order to invest in them as disciple, uh, as your disciples. A relational environment, um, we cannot go only uh, content, and I think our churches are doing, I think, a good job in, in through preaching to give content. Uh, but somebody told me or gave me this image. Uh, it might be familiar for you. When you preach, imagine that you have 200 empty bottles in front of you and you just sprinkle and try to fill them. When you, when you have a small group, you have just maybe five, six bottles and the same amount of water that you pour. So the, the impact when there's a relationship is much, much higher. And of course, I'm a strong advocate of having a, cur a curriculum. Um, this was one of the first questions I asked when I prayed before God, what to do with these two friends at the beginning, how people learn, how we, how we take in uh, um, and, and grow spiritually. Because all three of us spend our entire life in church. So we heard hundreds or thousands of, of sermons, why we are not growing more. And uh, I realized that there has to be a, a, a good balance between uh, theoretical teaching and practical applications. And if you think of a, of a medical doctor, would you like to, to go in a, into a surgery room with someone who, was, who had only highest marks in his theoretical exams, but he never ever did something practical? You know, uh, I once was uh, get a, got a haircut from someone who just was just in school and did not have any discipleship. Uh, well, I think people learn having both. You want, you need the theory, you need the basics in the Bible and in the Christian faith, but you also need the practical. You need to go out. You need to, uh, uh, you know, practice and be accountable uh, in in those areas. So um, I think this is why uh, we are not experiencing so much uh, growth in, in many of our contexts because it's just one direction, teaching to large audience, and people do not have the opportunity to ask questions, to see how you do uh, things, uh, to take them in your car, to take them in, when you go somewhere, or to see your, your life and to have them in your home. To see to see your uh, your family, um, I would guess I would go faster on this. But I I mentioned the the idea of the curriculum because I think this is critical, especially if you want to multiply. I had this experience with um, people that stayed with us two years. They were excited. We were best friends. At the end, I tried to convince them to start their own group. We are going to finish this summer, and I will help you, and you start your group. And they were uh, scared to death because they had no plan. I mean, all those two years in, while we were students, we just, you know, studied, you know, this passage of the Bible this week, you know, next week. What did you read today? Oh, that. Oh, let's study this. And it wasn't, we had no curriculum, no structure. And in the end, they didn't know how to go forward. But when you have a structure, it really helps them. For example, we started with spiritual disciplines. We studied, you know, make the, 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 the platform, the, the biblical uh, foundation. And then we follow up on our lives, our own lives. Well, this was something very practical. They can do now with other other people. It was a clear, clear topic, uh, clear things to, to follow up in our lives. So I really believe that curriculum helps both us in growing, but gives courage to people to try the same thing they learned with 
another group. And this is how multiplication comes. And one last this, uh, thing before we go into discussion. Ingredients for a good and I would say uh, successful uh, discipleship group. Uh, first of all, Bible study. There are groups uh, that are very shallow in this aspect. Uh, they, they want more, and it's, it's important, the relationship. And they want to socialize. They want to have good time together. And they have. And they prepare good cakes and juices, and they, you know, they go out to, to play soccer. This is very popular in Romania. You know, they, uh, but there's no Bible study. From my point of view, if the Bible study is not a central, an Im a most important value of your meeting, there's no way, there's no point of calling it a discipleship group. Uh, you, can, you can call it a group that tries to outreach, you know, to make friends, to, and, and you know, I understand there are uh, groups that need to do this in evangelism or pre-evangelism especially, but if the goal is to present someone mature in Christ, then the Bible study have, has to be uh, uh, at the center of the meeting. Uh, prayer, uh, again, part of the spiritual disciplines, and I think we need to rehearse this in, in our discipleship group. Uh, leadership rotation, you know, in the first meetings, this is probably not possible. Your disciples would, maybe they are afraid and would like you to lead and you will lead. But after a while, or by the time you want to, to teach them multiplication and encourage them to start their own group, I think it's very important to start this idea of leadership rotation. And what we do is, I, uh, we meet in homes and not in the same home. So if we are five of them, five of us, maybe four of us can host, maybe someone cannot in his home, has non-Christians, or it's not a proper place. But the four of us, uh, when we meet in, in uh, your home, you lead the, the, the group that night. When we meet in your home, you lead the group. And in this way, they uh, you know, start practicing and you are there to help. Uh, maybe you can meet with them uh, earlier in the week just to go through and give some ideas and give courage. But in this way, I think, I think they need to step into a leadership role um, after, after the first steps in the, in the group. Uh, encourage active participa participation of all. Uh, you may encounter this, at least in Romania. There are people who are very shy and they will stay calm, say nothing all the time. And they are happy in that, in that position. There are others who always have a comment, always step in. You know, it's your role, and I think it's very important that during one meeting, everyone had the chance to say something. Um, there are introverts who you have to force them, but as the group uh, gets closer in their relationship, this will be easier. I think it's important to calm down some people who talk too much and to encourage everyone to, to, to say something. Uh, of course, humor, I think, helps a lot. And especially with uh, students, um, they, they like a quote or an image. Images look, look or short videos look, uh, work very, very, very well. With uh, young families, I forgot to tell you, we have two, two types of discipleship groups with uh, students or singles and with young families. With young families it's easy, just open up with a story about your kids and then someone else will tell you and you can laugh for an hour. Usually you, we, we try to keep this into 10, 15 minutes, uh, but uh, it, it warms uh, the hearts. Flexibility, uh, I said that at the beginning it's important to set expectations and at the beginning, we decide which day of the week is the best option for all. And then we said, okay, every other week. We don't meet weekly because it's quite hard. People are quite busy. 
but we meet every other week and we def we make this very clear unless you are in a crib you must be at this meeting but there's nothing i mean you commit for a year to be part of but there are times when we need to be to be flexible uh, you know if it's a matter of hospitalization we had a few uh, experiences like this you know his wife went into the emergency room so we canceled the group and went there and prayed with him and encouraged and you know took the car and buy some food uh, to bring or things that they need so and I think this this moment when they see that you care and even if you made it very clear and you were quite tough on them with uh, punctuality, with uh, the presence in the meetings, when they see that you care in their situation, uh, it, it's, it brings much fruit in the relationship. It brings people closer. Uh, very recently, we had someone who um, uh, has a house and he hits his house with wood uh, and just half an hour, just by the time he would leave for our meeting, a big truck with wood came and it was 20 uh, cube, uh, cube meters to take it off and to store and he said, I can't come. And we met as the group and we decided, well, let's all go and help. And this was really a, a real testimony for, for his whole family, for his parents, one of his parents, his father was not a Christian. And they really, really were impressed. So flexibility in this, these crucial moments, uh, and you will, you will feel them, and you will get to know this, these things as you, as you get to know their lives. Uh, but also discipline. And I think I already underlined uh, discipline in the meeting days, discipline, and we have to discipline ourselves. Um, I, I remember, and uh, I think my friends from Romania understand this, uh, there are times in our, in our, let's say, church life year when uh, we have special meetings for revivals, evangelism, and um, uh, one time I received an invitation to a large church, which, you know, for my ego would be something. I mean, I'm preaching to this church. And uh, it was precisely the night of the week when I had my discipleship group. So I stayed before the Lord. I, I thought for a minute, I to, to admit, what if I made one exception, one, only this time? But then God touched my heart and I said, no. Uh, and I called uh, this pastor and I said, I, I, can't, I can't come. And he gave me a really tough lesson. Why? And, and I gave him the answer, you know, I'll be with my discipleship group. Wow, I'm offering you thousands of people. You can speak into the lives of thousands and you. But I think moments like this, makes your group love you more because they, they realize that you love them more than any other, you know, thing that, you know, might, might nurture your uh, CV or your ego. And also, I think it's important to have discipline in, in starting time and ending time. I don't know what's in your context, but in a Latin country, it's hard to start on time. And if you, if you say, and I saw groups which did this, they said, well, 15 minutes, it's, it's acceptable. When people learn that you don't start only when it's 6.15, next time they will come at 6.20. And they will push this. And then I have friends who said, I arrived at the place when the first hour I could do nothing. People just come, came later. So it's important, I think, to start on time. And if someone, you know, you're already praying and he comes in, next time he will feel, I mean, he will come on time because he doesn't want to be all the time the black sheep that comes late. Uh, and then you need to end on time. Again, in Latin countries, this is very hard. As the discussion starts and, you know, everyone says something, uh, 
it's very hard to end on time. But uh, I realized that in our groups, many times we have maybe half of the group, people that are coming from non-Christian families. And for them, you know, it's, it's a culture of shame. Oh, I don't want to be always the first who leaves the room. The others will believe that I'm, I'm not happy with them, I'm not polite. And, but on the other hand, you know, uh, at home, it's a problem. Uh, if their wife, I had two, two cases when their wives were not Christians, uh, or uh, their parents or others see them coming late. So I think it's important to say, okay, we are done, shake hands, uh, and then if they want to stay some more, that's fine. But not, uh, you know, let, let this freedom for those who, and I think this kind of things. And discipline also, uh, one last point, in sticking to the topic you've decided to talk. It's so easy to, you know, someone comes with, uh, he wants an, a little explanation on this thing, and then the discussion goes oh, far away from what you need to cover. Uh, if you believe that, you know, today we're speaking about, I don't know, the importance of Bible reading every day and how do we do our devotion, um, we stick to this topic uh, and, uh, you know, then end on time. Uh, quickly, what are some, I call them poisons, uh, things that can destroy or uh, make, make the group miss, the, miss the, the goal, miss the target? And I just mentioned a few of them. I think the first one is the biggest sin we can commit, a boring Bible study. And especially with someone who is from outside the church and who's, who's enthusiastic, he's at the beginning, he wants to see the Bible, discover. If we, if it's a, it's a boring Bible study, ah, it's, I think that the effects are very, very dangerous. Discussions without substance, um, persons which monopolize the discussion, uh, lack of honesty or reality anchoring, um, you know, they are at the beginning. If we say you have every day for your devotional, spend an hour Bible studying, another hour prayer, I think this is not really realistic. Uh, and I remember uh, my wife had a, had a really uh, uh, an experience that changed her perspective. Um, in their group, uh, somebody raised the standard quite much. And she said something like, I wake up every day at five o'clock, spend an hour in the world, and, and the whole group felt like, oh, we, we must do this. So one of the ladies, you know, under the guilt, started to do this, but she was pregnant, and very soon the baby came. And then, you know, she felt so guilty that she cannot spend time with God as the other members in the group. And I think this is not uh, a reality. I mean, a, a young mom, it's not possible to request this. I mean, she's, she gets sleep uh, so little. And, um, and again, expectations that are, are realistic for, for our people. Criticism in, in our Balkan countries, at least, it's easy to go into criticism quite and negativism. And we, we need consciously to, to step away. And um, food. Food is a tricky one. Um, with students, I think food is mandatory. Uh, students eat a lot and they need to eat a lot. And my wife, when we first started our group at home, she prepared some food for the students and they ate all. And she was, she felt so guilt. She said, wow, I did so little for this. I thought uh, she, she didn't have any brothers. She was in a family only with sisters. So she didn't know how much boys eat. And uh, next time she did twice the amount of food. And they eat it all. <laughs> and, and I kept telling her, don't worry, put everything you have, students will eat all, you know. You know the definition of students. 
a piece of skin stretched over a huge hunger. Um, and, and it works. With them it works. But with young families, I think it's a, it's a poison. Um, I tell you what happened at least in our culture. We decided just to be polite and we had, like Gustav had last night, a cake and a juice and that's it. Next time we met in the house of someone else and he thought, oh, he had a cake and a juice, I'll have two cakes because just one cake, yeah. And so they prepared two cakes. The third meeting, oh, we have to have some, some sandwiches, you know, not only sweet, we have to have a salty part. And, and then it became a burden and we realized families who would, would withdraw for, from hosting a discipleship group because this was a pressure financially and also, you know, to prepare. You come from late from, from your job. So in that moment, we revolutionized this thing. And we said, no more food. Nobody, not even if it's your birthday, no food. And I tell you what, this really helped, helped a lot. And in just, just a few years, we arrived to seven groups with young couples because this pressure was there. At least in my culture, I discovered that this, this, this was a pressure. I noticed that couples that do not have children, they just cannot concentrate on a Bible study if the child is crawling. If you have already have one or two children, I mean, they can crawl on your head and you still... I learned from exams. Yeah, with, uh, so we, we can, these are not distractions, but what we've decided is we, we usually have two hours meeting. The first hour is an hour where, where we share last week's what we learned in the topic, we, the theme we had, uh, the assignments. Uh, then we share prayer requests, we pray, we sing. So it's more of this worship time. And then the second hour, it's an hour dedicated to Bible study. So we try to make sure that in the first hour, intentionally, kids are with us. And I think it's important for our kids to see mom and dad, they are not just acting as Christians in church. When they meet with their friends, they are having a good time and they are really genuine in their relationships and hear what they are praying for and, and they are singing and... And sometimes we ask them to sing a song or to, to say something from school. And the second hour, I think, I totally agree with you. They have to be out. Otherwise, you know. Okay, some of the fruits, relationship, relationships, spiritual growth, personal life change, all these experiences. There, there's no group which is the same. You will teach maybe the same curriculum, but you will see every group teaches you some more. And I think it's a spiritual discipline for us too. And springboard to fruitful ministry. I once uh, had one of my young disciple, disciples came to me and said, well, I, did, I was not raised in church and I don't want, I don't know how to, I don't know your songs. I don't know, I cannot be in the choir. I have not uh, uh, a good voice. Uh, and it seems to me that in your church, uh, if you don't have the gift of singing, you're not useful. I mean, what, what other spiritual gifts exist? And, uh, and they are not, if, if, if they exist, then, then they are not so important, like being in, you know, preaching or singing the choir. And uh, I really, I mean, it really touched my heart. And I thought, yeah, that's the culture. That's the way people usually see. And I stayed with him and I said, but tell me, what, what do you know to do? And because I believe that God sanctifies our talents when they become gifts. And he said, well, I'm an IT guy. I, I love computers. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit, I don't know, it was like he told me, well, you have this man, a dear man, an old man from the church in the hospital, and he cannot come to church. What if you go with your laptop on Sunday morning and stay beside his bed and showed him the, uh, we don't have transmission, so he needed to put a camera in the church, work. He was so excited. The next weeks, it was like 
he longed to be to, to for some of our members to be in the hospital. <laughs> he wanted to. He called me. He called me. Do you have anyone? And because he he lived this experience, you know, to be there, all the other people from the hospital coming and looking and you know seeing, listening, and people in the hospital on Sunday, they had nothing else to do, and it was a mean for the gospel, amazing. Then people called us to come and to pray. Can you get me this preacher here to, to talk with me? Yes. And so it, it's, I don't know, be creative. And, and uh, these discipleship groups, I think, help us to see new ways how we can, we can go out. Um, to encourage you, my story is God's story. This is the picture uh, we made when I left this church on my last uh, service um, and they gave me a picture 44 families uh, 42 out of 44 were not in the church when I joined the church and they all came through uh, this ministry and um, I want to point you especially this couple and this couple uh, at that moment, when we got to meet them, they were divorced. And uh, both of them remarried themselves. So they don't remarry somebody else. They reconciled. And the day I baptized them, at lunchtime, we had also the wedding. Uh, so discipleship groups really gives you, but this is not happening in one year. But in, in, if you are faithful, you will live with God some, some experience that it will give you fuel to continue in the ministry, even if it's hard, to continue on, on long term. And I pray God will bless you with this kind of experiences. Uh, I want you to put this picture. It was a reunion we had and a training. And you might see there Karen and Jim. Uh, and Tom and Judy, in another year, Jay knows they were with us last, uh, last year. And uh, this is the group we are having right now. Uh, a new group that we started uh, one year and a half. And this was our first uh, uh, re retreat. And I want to close with uh, a story that really touched my heart. Um, you know what is a baton? And, uh, in the Olympics, you have these four men running 100 meters, and then you have 20 meters where they run together, and then they pass the baton. And uh, in 1988, you can Google on YouTube, US team for this four man relay uh, competition uh, were clear clearly the winners. I mean, nobody doubt. They just, the question was if they break the world record or not. And so the first one started, and from, from the first one, they were ahead of all the others. They passed the baton to the second one. Um, then he ran very well, passed the baton to the third one, he ran very well. And at the fourth one, he looked back a little bit, moved his hand, and they dropped <coughs> the baton. And as you know, you are disqualified. And even if they had time to pick it up and continue, you're disqualified because you lost, you, you lost, the, lost the baton. So please, do not drop the baton of discipleship in your ministries, in your lives. May the Lord bless you.